Hey everyone, welcome back. Laszlo Montgomery here, China History Podcast, episode 220. The one where maybe we might get to the whole raison d'etre of this series. Poetry in the Tang Dynasty. China's most famous period. For poetry, that is. The Tang was a long dynasty, almost 300 years, 618 to 907. But before we get to these glorious centuries in Chinese history... Let's finish things up here in the mid-3rd century. We left off last episode looking at the Seven Sages of the Bamboo Grove, the Zhu Lin Qi Xian, a model for subsequent bands of witty and talented poets and writers who stood out from the crowd and were immortalized for their individual and collective genius at their craft. We've seen how things progressed from the four-character-per-line simple but elegant poems of the classic of poetry, the Shi Jing, into Ci, lyric poetry, Fu, epic poems or rhapsodies, the Yue Fu, music bureau, and Yue Fu, poetry, and finally the Jian An styles, championed by the three Cao's and other literary greats. By the final days of the Eastern Han Dynasty, the rules of poetry from Confucius's time were all being souped up because in these more sophisticated times, more sophisticated poetry needed to be composed. Starting in 265 and ending in 618 was a period in Chinese history called the Six Dynasties. These six are basically the Jin that commenced following the Three Kingdoms period, plus the Nanbei Chao, Northern and Southern Dynasties. I myself like to distinguish between the Jin and Northern and Southern Dynasties period, but sometimes they're both lumped together into the Six Dynasties. Throughout the Six Dynasties era, the three strands of poetry, painting, and calligraphy all continued to twist around each other. We know you had three different things going on with painting, poetry, and calligraphy. Early Chinese masters had begun to combine them into one, these most important of all skills in elite society. There would be a painting, and on that painting would be either the painter's calligraphy or perhaps that of the owner of the painting, and in some cases, even the calligraphy of the emperor. And those remarks, written in Superb calligraphy would always be their thoughts expressed in a few lines of poetry. To be great in any one of the three arts would gain any man or woman praise and admiration from their peers and in greater society. To master all three, well, that made you immortal. In the tongue, they'll call these the sanjue, the three perfections, combining all three into one single work. Now, I don't want to downplay the fact that all this time, poetry was also recited in the fields and streams of the countryside. And as far as the beautiful people, the officials and scholars and everyone else fortunate to have had a traditional Confucian upbringing, nothing topped poetry in terms of a medium for how a man, woman, or young adult could express themselves. And when people got together, especially in the top rungs of society, in all kinds of forms, and as a part of certain drinking games, occasions, customs, or a form of ancient Chinese repartee. Poetry was how you said it. And like I said, if you were good at it, people looked up to you. In the Tang, poetry was so woven into the fabric of daily aristocratic life, when you went to visit someone and they weren't home to receive you, you didn't leave a note, you left a poem. To describe a moment in time, you might express it in a poem. By the tongue, this was how it was. Just like in the Han Dynasty because of the Silk Road, by the Tang Dynasty, those trade routes first carved out in the 2nd century BCE had come a long way. China was awash with all kinds of new cultural influences from people from all over the known world who packed up their wares from where they came from, and took that half-year journey to trade in the Tang capital, Chang'an, and in all the great trading centers between the Levant and Japan. So all these happenings with these mingling of cultures going on, 
energized by the impact of this growth in commerce, naturally had some spillover effect on the new poetry that was becoming popular. At the outset of the Tang Dynasty, by an LBJ landslide, the most popular single reservoir of Chinese literature was the Wenxuan, a work with the no-nonsense title of Selected Works of Literature. It was compiled by Xiao Tong, eldest son of another literature-loving Emperor Wu, this one the founder of the Liang Dynasty, the third of the Southern Dynasties in the Northern Southern Dynasties period. Emperor Wu of Liang reigned 502 to 549, and during the 520s, Xiao Tong worked with a group of scholars to compile what they believed to be the best of the best as far as poetry and prose was concerned in China, from the end of the Warring States period up to that current time in the 6th century. And here with the Wenxuan, we can see literature just making its start as something other than a tool to please or serve the royal court. This Wenxuan, these selected texts, contain 761 works of prose and poetry from 130 writers. There were 37 categories of literary works, including styles we discussed last episode, ci or sao poetry, and a great number of fu rhapsodies and shi poems. And this literary anthology became the gold standard for a long time as far as the greatest single compilation of poems from China's ancient past. The five Confucian classics and the great works of Taoism were left out of the Wenxuan on purpose. I mean, those were in a class of their own. Xiao Tong and his team of librarians and scholars put it all together. And though this eldest son of this Liang Dynasty, Emperor Literatus, never lived long enough to become king himself, the importance of this work and his name that is attached to it still gave him a nice amount of street cred in Chinese history. I know we sort of heap all the glory on the Han and Tang dynasties, but the Six Dynasties period, from the conclusion of the Three Kingdoms to the Sui, was also a most fertile time for all kinds of literature. As I mentioned last episode, this was the part of Chinese history when Buddhism and Taoism hit the big time. So this compilation... The Wenxuan remained a must-have addition to any scholar's library till yeah, about the time of the Yuan Dynasty, when, you know, after 700 years, it was starting to become a little out of touch with the times. Will they ever say that about John, Paul, George, and Ringo? Not all of it, but a lot of the works contained in the Wenxuan managed to make it down to our modern times. And a lot of it, interestingly, ended up being discovered in the caves of Dunhuang. Besides that anthology, prior to the Tang, there were three other collections that, together with the Wenxuan, comprised the state of the art in Chinese poetry across every known style. I'll just mention them quickly, and if there's a translation for them available, all will be in the show notes, rest assured. The first one I already mentioned last episode. This was the collection of Music Bureau ballads compiled by Guo Maoqian, the Yue Fu Shi Ji. If not for this compilation by Guo Maoqian, the Yue Fu style of poetry might have been lost to us forever. The second collection, and this one came out just prior to the establishment of the Tang Dynasty, was called the New Songs from a Jade Terrace, the Yu Tai Xinyong. This compilation of poetry, like the Yue Fu Shi Ji I just mentioned, we also have the cultured people of the Liang Dynasty to thank. The New Songs from a Jade Terrace contain 670 poems from this Southern Dynasty's period. And this work is credited to Xu Ling. He was given the job by Xiao Gang, who is better known in the history books as the Liang Emperor Jian Wen, son of Liang Emperor Wu, and brother to Xiao Tong, compiler of the Wenxuan. Xiao Tong was the elder brother and crown prince, but he died before his time, and it was Xiao Gang who became emperor in 549. This father and two sons trio rivaled the three Cao's in their 
contribution to Chinese poetry and literature. One brother compiled the Wenxuan, and the other one oversaw the Yu Tai Xinyong, these new songs from a jade terrace. And together with their father, the Liang Emperor Wu, they were the greatest benefactors in the compilation and preservation of Chinese poetry during the Six Dynasties period that preceded the Tang. The third compilation I wanted to mention contained the largest collection of all of Chinese poetry up to the Sui Dynasty, late 6th century. And this collection, compiled in modern times, in fact, is called the Xian Qin Han Wei Jin Nanbei Chao Shi, and is conveniently arranged chronologically, and each poet was given a short bio and valuable commentaries on their poems. Qin Han Wei Jin Nanbei Chao, they're just the names of the dynasties and periods from 221 BCE to 589 CE. It's as much a reference book as it is a compilation of poems. This is probably the most exhaustive work of its kind for that pre-Sui dynasty period. Thankfully, between these three works and others that also survive in fragments and as parts of lesser-known compilations, we have a rock-solid repository of pre-Tang Chinese poetry that offered some imagery of those times and lets us peek into the minds of the people who lived in that period from over a millennium ago. One last thing. The amount of poetry that got written in ancient times far, far surpassed what we in our day managed to receive. I've said it before, much more was lost than what we got to enjoy today. But for a poem to get inclusion into any of these anthologies or collections that were commissioned by royalty, they had to be good. To make it into these works, there would always be a team of committed scholars picking every character of every line of the poems apart and determining if the composition they read was worthy of immortality and whatever they were commissioned to edit and compile. So what we get to read today truly is the best you can get. And last point, without all these compilations that I've mentioned, going back to Wang Yi and the Chu Ci Zhang Ju, the quantity of poems received in our day would be even much less. The first ones to put the Tang Dynasty poets on the highest possible pedestal were the people of the Song. It was in the Song Dynasty, roughly 960 to 1279, that the greatest Tang poets were lionized for their achievements in taking this most Chinese of cultural treasures to its highest possible form. And pretty much ever since, Tang Dynasty poets have always stood slightly off on their own as the greatest Chinese poets of all time. And the greatest time for poetry in this greatest of dynasties was the High Tang, the Sheng Tang. It took a while to get there, so... We'll begin with the early Tang first, the Chu Tang. The early Tang was roughly 618 to 713, Gaozu to just before Xuanzong. This was the period of Wu Zetian. So you know, Buddhism has already permeated every corner of the Tang Empire. Four superstars who best represented the collective achievements of the time that preceded the High Tang were the Chu Tang Sijie, the four paragons or four eminences of the early Tang or Chu Tang. These were Luo Bin Wang, Lu Zhao Lin, Wang Bo, and Yang Jiong. They came right at the beginning of the dynasty, mid 7th century, and kicked off what would be called China's greatest centuries for classical poetry. History remembers the four paragons of the early Tang as the earliest group of Tang poets who began to break with the past styles and, and begin something more fresh and current. At the outside of the Tang, this early Tang period, the Wu Yan Lu Shi had become the style that everyone began to compose. Wu Yan, it just means five characters. A Lu Shi was this relatively new hip poetry that really gathered momentum during the early Tang. A lot of the great stuff that followed in the High Tang 
came from these Wu Yan Lu Shi, these five characters per line, eight lines, regulated verse. There were five characters per line, and then this got pushed out to seven. And the seven character per line poem was called a Qi Lu poem versus the five character per line Wu Lu style. Qi means seven, Wu means five. No matter five or seven characters per line, these Lu Shi style poems all had the same rhyming pattern, always on the even lines, and whatever the rhyme was, it stayed constant throughout the poem. The evolution of this Shi style of poetry, I guess you can go back to the Gu Shi style with its Confucian overtones, four to seven characters per line, and this led to the Jin Ti Shi, Jin Ti just means modern form or modern style, and Shi means poem. It's the opposite of Gu Ti Shi. Gu means old or ancient. In fact, the Chinese character Shi, in the end, uh, became the Chinese character that ended up being sort of uh, an umbrella character for all forms of poetry. If you said you like Chinese poetry, you would say you like Chinese Shi. Then, once that was established, you could get down to the nitty-gritty of the particular styles that appeal to you. By now, you're familiar with some of them. Jin Ti Shi became simply known as regulated verse. And it was this regulated verse in all its forms that became one of the hallmarks of the Tang Dynasty. All the greatest Tang poets I'll name between now and the final bell were all masters of this Jin Ti Shi poetry. They didn't invent it. It first appeared during the Liang Dynasty, that nice, fertile period for Chinese culture. Like all the past and future paragons of poetry, each of these four eminences of the early Tang have their famous poems attributed to them. And not all of these Tang poems were in the Jin Ti Shi styles. Poets in the Tang were still composing Ci poetry in the style of Qu Yuan, as well as Fu rhapsodies. That stuff didn't go out of style and still had centuries of staying power left in them. As far as the one name that more than any other deserves a mention with respect to ushering in this new Jin Ti Shi regulated verse, there was one. He was Shen Yue, who lived 441 to 513. That puts him in the Liu Song and Southern Qi dynasties, the two southern dynasties that preceded the Liang. So this regulated verse and all the tones and rules and regulations started with Shen Yue in the Six Dynasties period and was later taken to its highest form by these Tang poets, starting, of course, with the early Tang. The tail end of the early Tang period, the time of Wu Zetian, there was already no shortage of renowned poets. During Empress Wu's time at the top, the definitive anthology of this period was compiled, and this one by a poet named Cui Rong, and the name of this work that stands alongside so many other imperially sanctioned compilations was called The Collection of Precious Glories, the Zhu Ying Ji. This anthology of poems contained the works of Cui Rong, Li Jiao, and Zhang Yue. Those three names in particular rose to the fore in this late, early Tang period of Chinese classical poetry. What's most interesting about this collection was that well, this was one of those that had been heralded throughout the centuries, so its existence was known. But sadly, no copies existed. That is, not until the discoveries in the Mokau Caves in Dunhuang in 1907 by Oral Stein. In all, about 55 poems from this legendary collection were recovered from the caves, about 20% of the work. You see, this is how Chinese history keeps happening. Remember the oracle bones that only got discovered at the start of the 20th century? Up until then, the Shang Dynasty was still a myth. Discoveries are being made every day in China that reveals a little bit more about the ancient past. Some of it we read or hear about in journals and in the press, but most of the discoveries, the incremental gains, it doesn't make the news. But this discovery of fragments from the collection of precious glories 
added to the understanding about those years from 690 to 705 when Wu Zetian carved out a place in history as the only woman to rule China as empress in her own name. I have to say, uh, in Tang poetry, no matter the merits and achievements of those poets who came before and after the high Tang period, their fame and the admiration people had for their poetry will always be eclipsed by the brightness of the stars of this high Tang period that lasted from 712 to 755. Yeah, the supernova was so great, it didn't take more than just the few top names of this period to drown out so much of the greatness of a thousand others. And fueling the hottest part of that supernova of poetic greatness were three men. Li Bai, Du Fu, and Wang Wei. We'll look at the lives of all three and read a few of their poems. What's most convenient and interesting is that all three were contemporary with each other. Li Bai and Du Fu even met each other and kept up quite a vigorous correspondence. The rock and roll equivalent of this high Tang era would have been England and America in the 1960s. And you could rest assured during a period such as this, when so many greats were all composing poetry all at the same time, these renowned Tang poets, well, they didn't form bands or anything, but so popular were they and so beloved were they by all lovers of poetry, many of them would be immortalized by being a member of certain groups with some catchy name that maybe defined them. And by remembering these legendary groups of poets, it helped put some historical background behind their work. The High Tang kicked off with the Four Gentlemen of Wu Zhong, the Wu Zhong Si Shi. These four all came from Jiangsu and Zhejiang, two provinces in China that decade after decade and century after century would time and again keep delivering some of the greatest literary figures in China's long history. There were so many compilations of Tang poetry, but two stood out above all the rest, and neither of them came out in the Tang, nor the Song, nor the Yuan or Ming, the two definitive works that are considered the ultimate compilations of poetry from the Tang dynasty came out in the Qing. And how a Tang poet managed to gain immortality is one of the greatest poets to come out of the dynasty most celebrated for its poetry was by inclusion in the Tang Shi San Bai Shou, known in English as the 300 Tang Poems. The other was a Quan Tang Shi the Complete Book of Tang Poetry. This Quan Tang Shi, this Complete Book of Tang Poetry, this work preceded the 300 Tang Poems and had, as its sponsor, no less an emperor than Kangxi himself, who called for all known Tang Poems in his day, early Qing Dynasty, late 17th, early 18th century, to be compiled into one single comprehensive work. And after all the heavy lifting was done and this team of scholars had scoured the land for any and all poetry composed in the Tang, when it was presented to the emperor, there were 49,000 poems culled from 2,200 Tang poets of various renown. And as I said, when it was all done and the Kangxi emperor in 1705 gave it his stamp of approval, well... It was quite impressive. If you read two a day from this collection, it would take you 67 years to plow through it. Then later on, in the time of the Kangxi Emperor's grandson, Qianlong, in 1763, he called for a kind of shortlist or, you know, box set of platinum hits, uh, if you will, of the 300 most important poems from the 49,000 found in the complete book of Tang poetry. Of course, the big three, Li Bai, Du Fu, and Wang Wei, are well represented in both works, but those who made it into the Tang Shi San Bai Shou, the 300 Tang poems, eh, they were in a very elite group. I wondered why the number 300, that seemed rather arbitrary, 
Well, 300 was the approximate quantity of the poems that are contained in the ancient classic of poetry, the Shi Jing. The Tang Shi San Bai Shou was sort of a nod to that most ancient of all Chinese poetry collections. Like all great anthologies and compilations, the 300 Tang poems also had its champion. This was Sun Zhu. Sun Zhu sought to compile a single work that not only contained all the most important Tang poems, but those which had the additional value as an aid for students in their studies. The 300 Tang poems, I'll have a link to this work in translation. Plenty of Chinese children carry this book in their school bag. I doubt it's much use today, but back in the day, Qing and Republican period, it was like Dick and Jane. It was a schoolhouse staple. My dear listener Savio, up in the great nation of Canada, can attest to this. He told me back in the 70s in Hong Kong, he had to memorize selected poems from the 300 poems. And the penalties for not being able to regurgitate them on demand meant a few strokes of the cane. And 40 years later, thanks to a few raps on the palms of his hands, he could still say a few. So, maybe some truth after all to Proverbs 13, 14. Besides the three biggest names just mentioned, you also had the three biggest names who came after them. Li Shangyin, Meng Hao Ran, and Bai Ju Yi. We'll look at them too in later episodes. The 300 Tang poems and the Complete Book of Tang Poetry were the two most famous of all the 130 or so anthologies of Tang poetry compiled between the Song and Qing dynasties. Plus, later on, after the discoveries of Dunhuang were cataloged and studied in the early 20th century, even more Tang poems were added to the vast reservoir already received. I wanted to mention uh, just one more of these very renowned and well-respected works that not only brought everything current about Tang poetry into the Ming Dynasty, 1380 to 1644, it had this innovative nine-rank grading system where every poem in the anthology was given a critical analysis and a ranking. In Toto, this work, known as the Tang Shi Pin Hui, contained 5,769 poems from 620 Tang poets. And the name, forever associated with its compilation, was Gaobing. In English, Tang Shi Pin Hui was called the Graded Compendium of Tang Poetry. Anytime a poem was accompanied by some kind of commentary or ranking as in the Tang Shi Pin Hui, it was like not only getting the poem, but the cliff notes as well that helped to provide further insight into the poem's meaning from scholars who lived much closer to the times when these poems were actually composed. Let me say again, that's a constant throughout the history of Chinese poetry. As soon as enough time had passed, emperors would, you know, often in their quest for immortality, call for someone to go see where the country was at this moment in China's history with respect to its poetry and literature. And lucky for us, these great works would get painstakingly compiled by passionate scholars. Each dynasty had their own mega projects that they championed. And the bottom line is that, thanks to many of these imperial vanity projects, there's more tongue poetry that made it down to our time than we can almost ever read. In the next episode, we're going to start examining the main poets of the High Tang period, the Sheng Tang, High Tang. It's a dramatic way to say the poetry that was produced during the 43-year reign of Emperor Xuanzong. He had one of his poems included in the 300 Tang poems. I guess, all things considered, since this High Tang period yielded such a rich harvest on the Xuanzong Emperor's watch, it's only right that they you know, gave him a little face and included one of his poems among the elite 300. He was the son of the Reizong Emperor, which meant his gran was Wu Zetian. Like emperors Wu of Han and Liang, Cao Cao, and his sons and many emperors who followed him, Xuanzong was a hardcore 
patron of the arts, and like I said, sort of styled himself as an emperor literatus. Not the first, and not the last, that's for sure. His enthusiasm for theater and dance was especially strong, and he's sometimes called the father of Chinese theater. And he was also said to be very accomplished in the Chinese martial arts. So a guy like this, who had his pedigree, his dramatic story prior to the commencement of his reign, his love of learning, theater, literature, the arts, and such a long reign to boot. It's no wonder Tang poetry enjoyed its golden age during this reign of Li Longji, the Xuanzong Emperor. Next episode, we'll start looking at all the greats and eh, maybe hear a few poems, you never know. Okay, one last thing. Oh boy, if you didn't catch the recent Seneca, what a treat. The great Mark Rosewell, my relative, so I've been told by you know hundreds of Chinese, was the guest this time, hosted by two other faves of mine, David Moser and Anthony Tao. Great episode recorded at the Bookworm in Beijing. If you're a student of the Chinese language, just interested, don't miss this one. One of the best all-time Senecas. Also, go check out Anthony Tao's new work. If you like poetry and classical guitar, oh, it's two for the price of one. I'll have a link to that in the show notes. The Last Tribe on Earth. Check it out at poetryxmusic.bandcamp.com. Wow. Listen to the whole thing already. Fei Chang Zhe Ting, Anthony Tao's poetry, and Leon Halton on classical guitar. Okay, for now, let's put the bookmark in. Laszlo Montgomery signing off from Los Angeles, Southern California, beseeching you, as I always do, to come back next time for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast. <laughs>